Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. There was a time where Ryan and I really had to stare hard at payroll. And that's something that I know keeps a lot of entrepreneurs up at night if they're asked, like, what keeps you up at night? Yes, there's strategy and go-to-market and so forth. But if you have employees, it's almost always that. Because you care about them and you want to make sure you can honor your commitment, the social compact, to pay everybody on time and the right amount. And so we really look hard on that because, you know, we had a burn rate at that point. And so we were running the math and here's the sales numbers we need to hit and the development milestones on the roadmap we need to hit in order to get where we need to go. So, you know, there was a period there where if you're looking at pro formas or projections, like we were right on the baseline making things work for a period of several months. So those were heady times. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. Welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. Today, I'm interviewing Brandon Bruce, co-founder of Cirrus Insight. Cirrus Insight is a plugin for Gmail and Outlook for salespeople. It's an all-in-one sales productivity platform, which helps salespeople with things like email tracking, sending templates, sending reminders, scheduling meetings, and more. They have over 150,000 paying users across 5,000 companies. They have 58 employees and last year did $12.8 million in revenue. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Excited to be here. Awesome. All right. Well, Brandon, let's talk about how you came up with the idea for Serious Insight. Oh, I'm going to have to give credit to my co-founder, Ryan Huff, for that. He was the original founder. He came up with the idea. But thankfully, we've been friends for almost 20 years. So we met, we're not sure, either freshman or sophomore year of college out at UC Santa Barbara. And built websites together and got excited about this whole internet thing during the late 90s. So we sort of saw the boom, saw the bust. He went on to work at IBM and a bunch of great tech companies. I went on to law school and then he called me, you know, years later and said, Hey, I've been programming in Apex for this platform called Salesforce. And it's great. Unlocks all the data that companies store about their customers. But I see a gap in the market. Like a lot of companies are moving to Gmail. And there's nothing that connects Gmail with Salesforce. And so I'm starting to write this Chrome browser extension that will show Salesforce inside of Gmail. So you can get all your work done without leaving the inbox. And I was using ACRM at the time. It wasn't Salesforce, but I was jumping back and forth between that thing. At the time, actually, it was Blackbot. I was working in higher education. I was using Blackbot, Razor's Edge, but jumping back and forth with Outlook. And so when he described the time savings that you could get by bridging the two platforms, I was like, that sounds like something I would use. I bet you other people would too. And he said, why don't you start making some calls and try to get some people that are willing to try the software as soon as the extension's ready. And I said, you got a deal. So he's the technical founder, right? The one that did the work on the product, that architected it, built it. My role then, self-described, was to figure out the go-to-market. How do we get this out there? See if people will use it, provide feedback. And then later find out if it's something that they would pay for, right? Was this going to be great freeware, just a cool utility that we could distribute and just say, hey, we contributed to the community? Or was this something that we could make a business out of? Or would people be willing to pay for it? So that was my job. We kind of started doing that. He started coding in the spring. I kind of jumped in to help him in the summer of 2011, so a little over seven years ago. And then you know, we made the fateful decision to launch the app in December of 2011. And we really went back and forth on that one. Because we had had about a thousand beta users providing feedback. And the feedback fell into two big buckets. The first bucket was, you got a lot of work to do. This is a cool app, but man, we would like you to add these hundred features to it. And that would make it super awesome for us. Thankfully, this other bucket of feedback was, man, this is already saving us a ton of time. Like we're not jumping back and forth between the inbox and Salesforce. We just click a button and it logs email Salesforce and we can see leads and contacts and create new leads and contacts for the sales pipeline without leaving Gmail. This is great. In fact, we'd probably be willing to pay for this because it's increasing our adoption of Salesforce. And so we listened to that second piece of feedback and decided we're going to keep iterating, but it makes sense to launch and try to get a foothold in the market. And so we launched in December of 2011 and picked up our first you know, paying customers. And that kind of started the flywheel effect that is software as a service. Awesome. All right. So let's backtrack on a couple of things here. So you met your business partner in college. You guys knew each other for a while. He had this idea of syncing or making it easier for salespeople to get their information over to Salesforce without having to manually enter everything. 
So how did you know that your friend was going to be a good business partner? Or did you guys talk through these things or are there some things looking back that made you guys have a good partnership that's lasted this long? Yeah, it's a great question. I think both of us really had a lot of confidence in the friendship and felt like as a result that we would work well together. I think also those first several months, two, three months of doing it helped to build our confidence that we could translate that friendship into a good business partnership that we had complementary skill sets that we could talk for four to eight hours on the phone every day because he's in Irvine, California. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so, you know, if we'd gotten tired of that, like, oh, he's calling again, then I think it would have been like, oh, we should probably do separate projects. But we enjoyed that. We could push each other. And also, once we ended up starting the company together, I think there was a really good balancing effect, which is why, incidentally, I think a lot of investors will look for multiple founders instead of just the one. Because not only are there complementary skill sets and, all, and talents and all that good stuff, but there's kind of an emotionally stabilizing effect of having another person you can share the roller coaster with. So if I got super excited about something, then Ryan could kind of level set and say, hey, let's, let's keep our heads down and keep working because that's just one customer. We got to keep getting more. And meanwhile, if one of us got really low, like, oh man, the customer left or I thought they were going to sign, they decided not to, or I don't know where sales went this week. They were high last week and they're low this week. So maybe that's all the customers we're going to get. The other one could kind of say, ah, relax. Remember that happened three months ago and you know we're three times bigger than we were then. So everything's going to be okay. So, so building the business with a friend, I think was great. Semicolon, and everyone has seen this. The biggest thing that causes early stage you know, companies to fail is that the founders break up. And it happens. It's not necessarily a bad thing. People see another opportunity and like, never mind that thing we were working on. I'm going to go over here and work on something else. But it is a threat, obviously, to building the company. And so it was nice to be in it with someone that was also committed. We made a mutual commitment. So sure, it's like a legal commitment. We're both in the company and so forth. But more important than that is kind of the social compact that comes with, hey, you're in, right? Yeah, I'm in. So it's kind of the word is your bond, old school sort of stuff where it's like, okay, if we're both going to work 100% time, 24 hours a day, then we're both going to do that. And so even though you know, we're 2,000 miles apart, I knew that he was working all the time. He knew that I was working all the time. We were both hustling and that was good for us. Okay. So you guys decided to get started in spring 2011 and didn't launch until December. So you guys had six months or so to do that. Where Did you guys quit your jobs at the time? Did you guys take on some money? How did you manage that transition period before getting your first customers? So we both worked full time during that process. I was working for a college in advancement, aka fundraising, aka frontline sales. So it was good to have that experience and kind of bring that knowledge of what it's like to be consistently selling day after day. Because, the, you know, Serious Insight is we're selling sales software to salespeople. So it's helpful to you know, speak that language, understand the challenges, understand the highs, the adrenaline rush of, of closing deals. And meanwhile, Ryan was running a successful consulting company, essentially developing software for software companies that wanted to port their offering onto the Salesforce platform. Mm-hmm. And so he could do that work. So even after we launched, we were still both full-time in those jobs, but then burning the candle on both ends to get the startup off the ground. After about six months of that, then I first made the commitment like, hey, I'm going to leave my job. This is overwhelming. We've got to decide that we're all in on this or not. And if we're not, we're always going to wonder what might have come of it because it seems like we have some initial good customer traction. And so when I did that, I think, you know, that also encouraged Ryan to like, okay, I'm going to finish out my remaining projects and then transition, you know, my consulting firm to other owners. And then he was all in also. And so from that point on, you know, he and I really ran the company for those first nine months, just the two of us from December until August of 2012. And at that point, we kind of made the decision that we would try to bring on some investment because an investor came to us. And that was really exciting. And we thought, this is great. This is a reputable, big computer company in the Irvine area, saw us, thought it was complimentary to their market and said, we'd like to invest in you guys. And it was like, oh, well, in that case, we need to quickly write a business plan. Hadn't done that. We just launched and started selling. And so we you know, wrote out the plan and got kind of excited about it. Because once you write it out and you can see it, it's like, oh, that's the vision. Let's do this. And so we presented the plan and they said, great. You know, for the first tranche, we're going to try to do a half million dollars. We're stoked. 
And then literally after that conversation, which again, it's just a conversation, nothing was written, nothing was signed, but we were still excited. The next day they were acquired and that acquisition shut down all of their acquisitions and investments. So we're like, oh, well, that was exciting for a little less than 24 hours. But on the positive side, the, uh, the silver lining to that cloud, since we're a cloud software company, was that we were able to parlay that same business plan and raise money from angel investors that said, yeah, you've got the plan. You're ready to go. We'll do it on the same terms as this company was going to do it. So right at about the nine-month mark, that extra cash in the bank, in addition to cash flow from customers, it kind of gave us the psychological permission to hire some employees. Before that, we were like, we think we can do it, but we were a little skittish about having a good month in which everyone gets paid. And then maybe the next month isn't going to be as strong. And we worried about not being able to meet payroll. So having that money in the bank enabled us to go out and then we hired our first four employees. Okay. All right. So I want to jump into that, but let's back up a little bit. So your business partner had experiences like a Salesforce developer working for other customers. Yeah. You had some sales background, but how did you know, I guess, who to start calling and getting feedback about the product while your business partner is building it? So there were really three ways that we got those initial pilot users, which then translated into our first 500 customers. Number one was there were a bunch of people posting to online forums, essentially saying, hey, I'm a Salesforce user, but I'm moving to Gmail or I've started with Gmail and I'm not super happy because there's not a connection between the two. I feel like I'm burning a lot of time. I'm getting really frustrated, right? All these key terms of like not happy, frustrated, pain, wasting time. And that's the perfect place for some sort of solution. It's either a workflow solution or a product solution that brings a better workflow to them. Mm -hmm. So the first stop was trying to get in contact with all those folks, posting to the boards, starting direct message communications with those folks and say, hey, can we get on the phone? I've got something if you're willing to try it. You know, it's free, have the extension, give us feedback, et cetera. And scheduling long follow-up calls with those folks. So we did that. Salesforce by that time was obviously a formidable company already. Uh, now it's multiple times bigger than it was then. But even at the time, they had hundreds of consulting partners around the world that would do implementations on behalf of customers. So we didn't have a customer list of like, who uses Salesforce? You could try to figure it out here and there. But we thought a better strategy was let's get in touch with all the partners. They're experts. They can use their view across all their client base to provide good feedback. And if they really like us, they can bring in their customers to try it and provide direct feedback, which they did. And then the third way was, and Ryan did this part because he's based in California, is he went to Dreamforce in 2011 with a bunch of postcard-sized ads and walked around the floor. This is Salesforce's big annual conference in San Francisco. And walked the floor and it basically said, do you use Gmail? If so, go to this website and you can try our connector. It's free and we're in beta and we'd love your feedback. And so he just gave those to anyone that would put out their hand or listen. And after giving out a thousand of those or so, you know, a few people obviously took them installed right away and then several dozen others over the course of the next few weeks. And so that helped to build our base pretty fast. So it was just classic carpet bagging a conference, right? Just crashing conference, just handing stuff out. So those were the three ways primarily that we got our first thousand because we didn't, we didn't have a social media presence. I'd venture to say, at least on my own behalf, and Ryan can speak for himself, but that's not necessarily my strength. I'll participate on LinkedIn and I post once in a while, to Facebook and Instagram, et cetera, but I don't have big presence. And so we did not spread through social media. We didn't have an email list at that point. Neither of us had a reputation as entrepreneurs because neither of us had founded a software company before. So it wasn't like, oh, those guys, again, they're coming back for another hit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ryan had a great reputation in the Salesforce community. He was known as like an excellent architect, an excellent developer. So that was really helpful for those other consultants we reached out to. They were like, oh, Ryan built this? Okay. It's probably well built. Now let's see if it fits our business need. But otherwise, you know, we, we were really starting from scratch at that point and trying to figure out how do we hack a way to market. Okay. Awesome. So I think that's, that's really cool. You guys came out with a really compelling offer, obviously free. You can't beat that. So you guys get people in the door and you say, maybe like we want some case studies, we want feedback for them. So you give them a reason for testing it out. I'm curious how you took that from like free users, like number one, getting people to actually adopt it and try it out being it's free. There's no commitment on their end really. And then number two, once you did get them using, how did you make that transition to like, they're willing to pay for it now being it was a free product at first? Yeah. Those, so those early users, by and large, were folks that had enough pain 
or need for the product from the forums or from Ryan passing out postcards or finding our one page website on the internet that simply said, use Gmail and Salesforce, you should install this thing and check it out. You know, they, they were kind of the early adopters, right? The evangelists, the folks that had the energy already. So, mm -hmm. so they were coming in, we had about a thousand of those in the pilot period. And then we would just send out then an email to everybody saying, here's where we are, the feedback, we made these 200 changes. We like another round of feedback. And then, you know, here's our timeline, like here's kind of the goal. So once we decided to officially launch, we notified all those folks, hey, we're going to officially launch middle of December. However, you can contest a thank you to you as early beta users. You don't have to pay us for the first, I think what we said is four months. Now, if you want to buy during those first four months, then we'll lock you in at this super low price. And you'll have that price forever, assuming you want to stay with that level of product. If you want to buy after those four months, it's no problem. We're still going to sell to you, but that low deal will at that point be off the table. We're going to offer it to our first 500 customers. Hmm. So once we made that announcement, I was racing to get the first kind of real version of the website out, like more than one page. And so I was hustling to get it out because I knew my, my son was due to be born any day. And so I actually got it out on midnight the day before he was born. So it was live. And I thought that I had checked the box in WordPress that said, don't index the site yet. I had missed that box. So Google indexed it and one of our pilot users found it and he found the pricing page and clicked through and put an order through. And so it hit the bank and Ryan had wired it that if any money hits the bank that we get a text message that says, hey, you got a new order, a new customer. Great, a little dopamine hit, right? Positive reinforcement. So we both get this message. Where did this come from? And I called the person that submitted it and said, hey, you're, you're part of our pilot group. So you actually don't have to pay for the first four months if you don't want to. And he said, ah, getting a lot of value out of the product. I'm going to pay anyway. And so I might as well just get started now. I'll be your first customer. That was a great shot in the arm, right? I mean, we're talking about a $5 a month order, right? $60. So this is not going to put anybody through college. But for us, it was big. It's just like, you know, why, why when you go into a restaurant is the first dollar they made up on the wall? Like it's just a dollar. Now they've got hundreds of people in the restaurant eating. They make lots of dollars. It's important because it's the first one. It's like a proof of concept. It says, okay, we're we're heading down a path that we may be able to find a route to succeed. And so that was our first $60 order. And that made a huge difference for us. That gave us a lot of energy going into December and said, okay, let's get this thing out and see what happens, right? See if people will continue to download it and see if some of the people will buy it. It's interesting. So I think like what I'm hearing is like, you guys kind of basically started this as a trial and gave people updates on like this, how long we're going to test it for. And then what you did, which I heard uh, with the founder of price intelligently and they deal a lot on like pricing is you kind of once you got past the free period you basically said we're going to provide you a discount for a certain amount of months until you're going to catch up to what others are paying and the way he explained it is that's a better way to transition a user that's used to getting a discount so i think that's pretty interesting you did it that way yeah and we and we ran these ideas by the first users too, the would-be first customers because by that time we really had you know relationship is maybe an overused word at this point in sales but it is true. I mean, these are folks that we had talked with on the phone. Mm -hmm. These were the people that were like, ah, the side panel is a little too wide. It's a little too narrow. The font's too big. I prefer, you know, serif, sans serif. I want it blue. No, make that orange. And so these were people that reasonably, because it's true, believed that they really had a hand in shaping the product. So they, you know, we had a, a thousand people that got to play product manager. And these were people that wanted that. Because then it was like, oh, I got exactly what I ordered. You know, it felt like a custom order, even though it was the same for everybody. Software service function, same for everybody. But they could point to things and say, oh, yeah, I was the one that wanted the button shaped like that. Or I was the one that had it load this way or made it a two-click instead of a four-click install. So, you know, we were the first to market. And that was helpful. It helped us establish a beachhead versus future competitors, which launched in the ensuing months. But when we launched in December, if you wanted to connect Gmail with Salesforce, then Cirrus Insight was it. And so, yeah, people felt like, okay, we're in it with these guys. Like there's a lot of work to do on the product, but if I want something that connects these two platforms, this is what I'm going to be using. So it's kind of a partnership there. Okay. So let's talk about that inflection point. You guys get to December, 2011, you have a thousand beta users. A lot of them are saying this needs a lot of work and more features. And then a lot of them are saying that this is great. Let's do it. So did you guys have a big internal debate around whether you're going to launch this or not? And how did you decide to move forward? We did. I remember that conversation. We spent about two hours on the phone. We went through the roadmap. We decided that for the things that we thought would make the biggest difference for customers, that was going to take about four months. 
the entire roadmap was probably more like a year. But we we're like, look, we could get out in four months and we could be pretty happy about it, right? Pretty proud of like the bells and whistles. It could do some pretty amazing things at that point. But then we were also getting feedback from folks saying, this is pretty useful. Like we might you know, we'd probably be willing to pay for this. So what we end up deciding was, you know, it was one of those, you throw up your hands, like to hack with it, let's just launch, right? And it was like, you good? Yeah, I'm in. And then that was the decision. So it wasn't particularly scientific, except I think that we had been in the pilot long enough is like, no, we did that already. We need to, you know, move on and find out what the next stage of building the company is. And that, that was at the end of the day, you know, we've made a ton of mistakes. We've made some good decisions also. That was the best decision we've made because it did get us out first. It got us out early. And it kind of followed. I hadn't read the book at that point. I'm trying to remember exactly when it was published, but just this concept that was out there about the lean startup. We weren't necessarily following that as a framework, except that we were following it. We just didn't know. But you know, the advice that that book and what Steve Blank talks about is, and Eric Reese, who, who then wrote the book based on the conversations they had had, is like, you know, get out with this minimum viable product, which we had, you can save email Salesforce, you can look up stuff in Salesforce from your inbox, boom, and it installs in two clicks, right? It's like dead simple, easy to get started with. Take that and then based on feedback, just iterate as fast as possible without breaking stuff too badly along the way. And that's what we did. So if we look at our release notes for 2012, it's like, oh yeah, you know, three weeks after launch, like boom, 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 we launched three huge features and then wait another month and a half. And it's like, oh, a huge thing for all these users. You know, 100 people requested this and then we delivered it. Ryan just kept on hitting those milestones in the product so that there was a pretty continuous positive feedback loop. And we were starting to get the Amazon effect of good reviews, right? It's an Amazon world. So everyone checks reviews. Like, is the book good or is the book bad? How many stars do you have? It's the same on Yelp and OpenTable and everything else. And so, you know, we were on the Salesforce app exchange and the Google store, et cetera. And we started seeing nice reviews that kind of fell into two buckets. The users essentially said, this is saving me a lot of time. It's a time-saving tool. And we're like, that's great. More time for selling. That's exactly what we wanted to do. Meanwhile, what managers were saying is, this is very valuable to us because we couldn't for the life of us figure out how to get our users, our salespeople, our sales team to use Salesforce. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it. They felt like they were being forced to do manual data entry instead of talk with their customers. It's very frustrating to them. And so we just said, well, we'll make it as easy as email. And so the managers were like, this is great. Like they're not logging into the Salesforce web interface anymore, but they're putting a ton of great data into Salesforce and we can run reports now and we start to understand how our sales process works. Okay, awesome. So when you guys launched this, you guys both went full-time pretty quickly after. Do you remember like how much revenue you guys had like maybe in the first couple months after you moved people from the free trial to basically like paid customers? I'm trying to remember, you know, I was trying to come up with like on an MRR basis, but what's tricky about that is only after a few months, like most of the revenue is just brand new. It's not particularly recurring yet. You're just trying to grab customers here and there and it's very rocky, right? Great day, low day, great week, low week, great month, low month. But what I do remember because our first, you know, Ryan's family had supported us hiring some contractors to help with the initial development of the extension, right? To supplement Ryan's expertise in Salesforce, some front end people that could help on the extension side. And so we had spent $50,000 on that. And we were able to pay back that loan. I think if we launched in December, I believe we paid that back in March or April. Okay. So we had generated enough revenue, really all the initial revenue went back to paying off that loan and getting free and clear. And then going forward, you know, we were essentially investing the lion's share of any revenue back into the company. And then probably a couple months after that, we were like, hey, can we each take out, you know, a little bit of money to keep the lights on at home and that good stuff? And it's like, yeah, I think, I think so. It made us nervous to take money out, but it was a good idea. So it sounds like you guys are maybe making like 10 to 20 grand a month. Yeah, that's probably a fair estimate. And then when we started hiring people nine months in, I recall that we were right around 30 a month. So around about August of 2012, we had gotten into the 30s, 30, 35 a month in MRR. And then meanwhile, right at that time, we had raised our half million dollars in angel money. So the combination, we, we hired four people and that helped a lot. So two salespeople and a VP of marketing and someone to head up customer support. So interestingly, all four hires were on the operations side of the house. So Ryan was still solo developing this product that's now being used by thousands of people. 
And thankfully, our then our fifth hire was someone on Ryan's team out in Irvine to join him and, and help on the product side. But all four of our first hires were here in Knoxville. And it helped tremendously because it was at that point, I think once we crossed that thousand customer, not thousand users, a thousand customer mark, is when it starts to get pretty hard, in my opinion, to juggle. Like at that point, you've got you know, lots of customers with the same first name. So there's not just one John anymore. It's a bunch of Johns. And so just to keep everything straight, it's really helpful to have you know, smart people on deck that can say, okay, you take the next demo. You take the support ticket. You try to get out some good messaging on marketing. And I can take a baby step back and try to see how this company is going to evolve mm-hmm. versus sometimes Ryan would call me and be like, how are sales today? And I said, I have no idea. I just did support today and I'm going to do sales tomorrow. So then if I had done sales, he's like, Hey, did you get those tickets? I didn't do any tickets today. I just did sales. So it was hard to switch, right? Customers expect both. So it was nice to have employees jump in, you know, on deck literally just to help with the million things that had to get done. Okay. Awesome. So you guys got to this point where you guys survived on this $50,000 loan from Ryan's parents to help with the development, you were juggling a lot of the sales and marketing yourself, your business partner was building, and then you guys went out and raised some money and got these first five hires, two in sales, a VP of marketing, customer success, and developer. So let's talk about like the team that you had there. Like, What did that enable you to grow from when you guys were at thirty dollars to $35,000 a month? I mean, that really got us. I think on those hires, we certainly doubled and probably even a little bit more. And then we started hiring additional people in the springtime. So we're marching ahead and getting toward half million a year, seven fifty a year, and then we would have crossed that million dollar mark sometime in 2013 based on the team. So once we got into 2013, I think if we had that initial team of, you know, there's five plus me and Ryan, seven, we doubled the headcount again during that time period. So then we had a solid like 15 on the way to 20 people. And just because we were starting to onboard lots of customers, there was more than enough work to go around that we were filling calendars with demos, which was great. That was one of our early successes. You know, we tried a bunch of stuff. It's like, did that work? It's like, not really, or I can't tell. I have no idea. I have no metrics to measure it. But one of our early successes was simply making a really easy to book time with us. We decided people wanted to see it. They want to see a demo. They wanted us to show them all the features and how it worked. And so, you know, we put the calendar online and just said, you can grab your own time for a demo and we will be online and we'll meet you there and we'll show it to you. Mm-hmm. And so we sent out a big email and, and said, hey, whoever wants to see the next version of CRS Insight, we're going to unveil it on this day. And then after that, we'll be happy to show you a demo. And we sent out an email and we booked up Daniel, who's our first hire and is still today. And, and we booked his calendar about 40 hours of meetings. So we sent out an email and two hours later, he said, I'm good next week. Like I'm eight to five booked straight through. And we're like, oh, so that, that worked. That was interesting. So we, we've been rinsing and repeating that ever since, which just kind of makes sense, right? I mean, buyers, all the research has shown the price intelligently guys and others have shown that we buyers are out there online learning about the products we want to buy. Mm-hmm. We've already gone through substantially like more than half of the sales process by ourselves without engaging at all. So about the time that customer is ready to engage, it's like make it as dead simple as possible to get in touch with you. That's why I think companies like Drift and other chat-based companies are doing so well. It's like, don't give the customer a run around and force them to fill out a big form. Just be there. Be available. And say, yeah, sure, we'll meet you online. You want to do it now? You want to do it later? And our sales team early on, Daniel and others, learned that if a customer was overseas, if they were in Australia, which is like the opposite time zone, right? That if they want to do a demo at 2 in the morning, we did the demo at, at 2 in the morning because the product was very popular. People liked it. They were buying it and buying it relatively quickly. So it was like whenever a customer wanted to meet, we would meet. Doesn't matter what time of day it was. We still do those midnight demos, which is kind of a fun part of the culture. Okay. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. 
quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead Quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. All right, so I'd love to break this down a little bit more. So you guys start to put this sales model together. First of all, on the marketing standpoint, how did you develop the traffic or the email list that you're mailing out to line up these appointments? Yeah, so early on, we launched on the Salesforce App Exchange, which is similar to the iTunes App Store for Apple or the Google Play Store. So we kind of found a marketplace where people were likely to search and or gather and look for possible apps that could make them more efficient and effective saving time. And so a lot of our early leads in that first year or two came through there. And we had a lot of good reviews. We were the third highest reviewed app of all time behind DocuSign and EchoSign. And so there was a self-reinforcing process where the more positive reviews, the higher we were ranked, the more people saw it, the more people would try it, the more people would buy it and leave a positive review. Rinse and repeat. And so that helped tremendously. And then I was also very active in the Salesforce community in, in a several ways. And this would be applicable to folks that are building outside of Salesforce too. One, there's lots of boards. That's true with Apple and Google and Microsoft and every other big platform company. But I was very active in all the boards. People had lots of questions about how to use Salesforce, how to connect it with Gmail, how does this work? So I'd answer as many of those questions as I could. And then we showed up in person. And that's something that I think is becoming... It was valuable back then. And I think it's arguably becoming even more valuable now because now we're all receiving hundreds of emails every day and lots of voicemails and phone calls for those that still pick up the phone without letting it go to visual voicemail. But getting in person with folks and forging that, you know, having a handshake, looking people in the eye sounds quaint, sounds overrated, but it's so important. So I did a lot of user groups where I travel the country and, you know, land in Des Moines, talk with that user group. Okay, go to New York, talk with that user group, go to Chicago. And so it helped expose people, you know, one-on-one, they see the presentation, have a chance to ask questions. Okay, this company's legit. They came to Chicago on their own dollar. They present well. The app worked. And I got to see it with my own eyes. I don't have to trust anybody. I saw it. So I'm going to use it. And so we've continued to do a lot of those sales conferences, Salesforce user group meetings, Google meetings, some Microsoft partner events. All those things, I think, have been really useful for kind of the go-to-market piece of growing Sears Insight. Okay. So a lot of community involvement, whether that was online in forums or, or in person. Yeah. What were you guys like selling during this time when you had this like a salesperson? It was a per user thing. How much was it per user? Yeah. So it's, it's classic software as a service. At the time we launched, we did that special deal for early users that was $5 a month paid annually. So 60 After those first four months, we changed it to $9 a month or 99 a year. So you get a nice discount if you committed to annually. We ran that through the first couple of years. And then in 2013, we released what we called version two of Serious Insight. Why version two? We had already done several dozen releases because it was such a significant release. It was a change, an update of the user interface to take advantage of more modern frameworks and just a you know, better sense of design on our part. And also we delivered, I think, on... 67 of the ideas that people had shared with us in our own forum. Now, this is what makes your insight better. So these are the, the 67 highest user voted ideas. And we released all of them in one big release. So it was a very complex release, but it got us a lot of you know, positive reviews and attention online. And so we took that opportunity. We're like, man, we're providing a ton more value with all the stuff we just added. Is this the time where we want to ratchet on the price side? Because we feel like then when we looked across the marketplace, we're like, man, we're providing at least as much value as some of these other apps that cost a lot more. And so instead of nine a month, we changed it to 19. So it was over double the price, obviously. We left everyone at their current pricing if they were already a customer. We didn't want to mess with that. We didn't really do any research to come to that conclusion. We just decided as customers, that's what we would want and expect. We wouldn't expect someone to literally just email us and say, hey, we just doubled your price. We felt like that was a good way to make people angry and possibly lose a lot of customers that we didn't want to lose. Mm -hmm. So everyone was grandfathered in, if you will, to their existing pricing. But for new customers signing up, it was 19 a month going forward. The big positive out of all of that was the price was more than double and our conversion rate stayed identical from the day before we launched to the day after we launched the new app. So 
for those doing math at home, that meant that we essentially doubled revenues on new customers going forward. Our average revenue per user doubled. And that was, that was just kind of a guess that it should be a 19? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, how scientific was it? We didn't do a lot of focus groups or user studies. I think we talked with some of our early partners and early users, like, how do you see the value of the app? How would you compare it with some of these other things in the marketplace? But yeah, more so it was really a gut check. It was like, hey, if we saw this and this is what it cost and we use Salesforce, would we pay that? Okay. It's X fraction, X small fraction of your total Salesforce investment and look at the bang that you get for your buck out of it. This seems reasonable. It's defensible. We can easily explain it on a sales call. We don't have any heartburn about it. Like, well, geez, it's pretty expensive. It was like, no, it's still a deal. And so we decided that was the right price. And, you know, it had a nine in it, which again, we didn't look at any of the research really, except that you know, gas stations have, <laughs> have convinced us over the years that having lots of nines and then a five at the end is the right thing to do. So we didn't make it 1995, but we just made it 19 straight. And then that seemed to resonate pretty well. Okay. And then, so when you guys did that and your conversion method is basically through a demo with a salesperson, are they getting paid commissions or how do those numbers work out? Are you signing up like a lot of users on these plans or, you know, if you're signing up one user, it's probably not worth the salesperson talking with them. Right. And, and that's an interesting point, right? So a lot of our users, especially in the early couple of years, it was very self-service. So sometimes no touch. Hey, I downloaded this extension. It worked great. Put my credit card in. We're rolling especially for, you know, single or two users or three user teams. It's like, okay, yeah, we totally get it, right? We're technology forward. For others, though, it was like low touch. They might have a few questions. Like, yeah, we installed it. It works great. But, you know, we customized Salesforce a little bit. We're wondering if Sirius Insight will work with that. Oh, yeah, we certainly do. That's how Ryan built it. Let us show you how to do it. Cool. And then some of them got into like, well, now, now we're going to bring the boss in and he's going to want to demo also. Or the CFO is going to need to see this with her own eyes in order to sign off on the purchase order. So now we're doing two, three demos for the same customer. But almost always, those were the, the larger customers. Semicolon. We did and still do demos for anybody and everybody. You're a one-seat deal. Our salesperson will still do a demo for you. The, is the commission on that as high as if it was a 100-seat deal? No, it's not. But sometimes we don't know what we don't know. We think we have a sense of you know, who the customer is, how big they are, et cetera. More often than not, I say we're in the right ballpark, but we've been very pleasantly surprised on numerous occasions where someone comes in as a trial. We look hard at their organization. Oh, okay, cool. This looks like a one user consultant. It is a one user consultant, but they're vetting the app on behalf of their 250 user sales team that they're training on contract. Mm -hmm. So that demo just got really interesting financially. It looked like we were going to make $19 a month, maybe for a year, because most of our customers sign up annually. But it turns out that behind them is 250 users. And if we do right by them in this deal, they're going to include us in every deal that they do going forward. And so we decided before that, that those types of examples helped convince us that we really need to be as generous with time as possible. We didn't want to be, oh, no, sorry, you should go watch the recorded webinar because you're a small customer. You know, we wanted to get the great reviews and case studies from the small customers no matter what. And we also knew that behind many of the small customers were going to be really fast growing companies in and of themselves or folks that spoke on behalf of pretty big or fast growing companies. And so that, that sort of individualized attention, I think, made people feel valued. Like all of us have had the experience where you get chucked, right? You get chucked from a store like the retail person's like, hey, you know, can I, oh, I was just looking at you. Oh, okay. Cool. I'm never going to talk to you again because you're just, you know, a guy standing in the corner looking weird. But it turns out, yeah, we're there to buy something for our whole company. We're going to buy 50 mm -hmm. of the sweatshirts. Like, it's a pretty important deal. And the same happens in software and online where you feel like maybe, oh, am I not an important customer? I'm not big enough. I'm not growing fast enough. Whereas we feel a lot better if they're like, oh, awesome. You're a software company based in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's so cool. We totally want to sell to you. We want you to be our customer. They're like, oh, well, in that case, we probably will be. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I think that gives us a good idea of your marketing and sales. Like when you guys ramped up to a million, the last thing I wanted to touch on was just kind of your development and customer success during that period. Like how did you guys prioritize feedback and what to build and what did kind of that look like during that period? For me, my recollection at least was, was really during that period, this idea of customer success, like that phrase seemed to be coined during the development that we had as a company, which is like account management goes back since forever that people in software at least really started like, well, 
We think we've done a good job building our software. We think it's pretty intuitive. And yet, man, this customer success looks like it could be really important. And so people started talking about it. And then a little bit after that, we were like, yes, we need to do this. And really the impetus was when we started onboarding enterprise customers, where there's an expectation that along with their product, their project manager, who's going to help with deployment, implementation, maintenance, et cetera, training, that we're going to have someone on our side that's going to help facilitate all that, expedite it, make sure all their questions get answered fast, make sure the training is up to snuff. And so at that point, we started building a customer success team, which has been uh, instrumental, right? It's one of those things, just like a sales team, where if I look at the company now, how could we not have one? Of course we do, because we wanted to take that same experience of everyone can get a demo, everyone can see the software and understand it, to everyone can get trained. We can show whole teams how to use this. Oh, you want the application in French? Great, we translated the whole thing and we'll help you roll it out in French and in German and in Italian, like wherever your international locations are based or if you're a company based in Europe or Australia or somebody else, we'll go there, we'll do on-site training or we'll do it by webinar or whatever. So success has been critical. The support team obviously from very early has been important because we answer a lot of questions not only based on technical support for our own app, but sometimes people just have questions about, well, how does Salesforce work? Well, does Google do this? Or is that you guys? Or like, I just want the whole platform to work and I don't know whose issue this is. And we'll be like, oh, okay, cool. This is actually a Google setting that you need to change. But by doing that, we become kind of a, you know, the, the, the classical trusted advisor where it's like, oh, mm-hmm. so I realized I just asked you for support and it's not even your product, but I appreciate you answering me. And so I'm going to stay a customer of you guys because you, you took care of me. On the development side, you know, that's a ton of work to find great developers. Everybody in the software game knows this. Everyone listening that's an entrepreneur in software realizes how hard it is. Unemployment's very low today. It's been zero for developers for a long time. You can post jobs like we're hiring developers and then get zero resumes back because people are essentially fully employed, especially talented folks that are driven and are building stuff. So it really the opportunities to hire have primarily come through referrals. People that know each other like, oh, okay. So let's say John's been with our company for six months. And then so-and-so, oh, I used to work with John at this other company and you know, he's a 10 or I want to work with him again. So John becomes a magnet for attracting more people to our company. Life transitions, people moving into the area, people's spouses or significant others taking different jobs. Those have been important to track. And more often than not on the dev side, in addition to just personal referrals, which have been arguably the best source, we, you know, we've also used recruiters because it's so difficult to put the word on the street and pick up developers because everyone's fully employed. It's a very competitive market. Meanwhile, on the Knoxville side, on the operations side, you know, a lot of personal networks in the community, to Maryville College, the University of Tennessee, have been really helpful in finding our team here. Okay, awesome. Well, all right, Brandon, as we wrap up, I got a few questions I'd love to ask you. Number one, did you experience a time when you thought your business would fail and what did you do about it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've always known as a small company, there's the risk in the market that a very large competitor could come in and stomp on everybody. So you're kind of always aware of that. And yet, you get very used to living with that risk. So when outsiders come in like, Oh my gosh, what if this happens? The sky's falling. We're like, yeah, we totally know this. We've grown comfortable with the risk. Here are the steps we've taken to mitigate against it. Here are defenses we've put up. And we're a small company, so we're fast and nimble. And these are things to our advantage. But I do remember early on, even post, you know, the first investment, you know, we had hired employees, we had good cash flow, but it was still rocky. And so, you know, we were biased toward growth. And so there was a time where Ryan and I really had to stare hard at payroll. And that's something that I know keeps a lot of entrepreneurs up at night if they're asked, like, what keeps you up at night? Yes, there's strategy and go to market and so forth. But if you have employees, it's almost always that because you care about them and you want to make sure you can honor your commitment, the social compact to pay everybody on time and the right amount. And so we really looked hard on that because you know we had a burn rate at that point. And so we were running the math and here's the sales numbers we need to hit and the development milestones on the roadmap we need to hit in order to get where we need to go. So you know there was a period there where if you're looking at pro formas or projections, we really rode that line tight. You know, it wasn't like, well, here's the baseline and we're up here. It was like we were right on the baseline making things work for a period of several months. So those were heady times. Those kept us you know, really focused and just hustling until we came out the other side and said, okay, cool. Look, we've created margin. You know, now we're above that baseline. Now we can look at expanding again. 
which was good. But at the time you're in it, you don't know if you're going to come out or not. Yeah. So that was, yeah, that was the time that got our attention for sure. Okay. What's the one thing you did that had the biggest impact on your growth? Oh, it, again, it, it goes, it always, I think, goes to people. And that's been true when I've talked with other entrepreneurs as well. The X factors, the things that I think get you to the next level every time is the ability to bring on folks that bring their own energy and their own talents. And then they can have many breakthroughs, full-blown breakthroughs on behalf of the company. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, that made a huge difference because I'm over here working on this. And then this whole other person, is it's not just me anymore. This whole other person went and just killed it over here in a good way and helped the company get to the next level. So you know, going back to the beginning, having people to do those demos and do it in their own way, coming as a essentially solo entrepreneur, at least from the sales side, then it was very nerve wracking to hand over the reins and say, okay, we've done two dozen demos together. Now we've done some shadowing and now you're going to take this one solo. And I'm going to do the best to bite my tongue and like not interrupt and be rude and just letting someone do you as they say, like, you know, Daniel's going to give the demo differently than I give it. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, that was a good learning experience for me because then it was like, oh, wow, how he just answered that, that was better than I do it. Or how he transitioned to the next call. That's the way we're going to train everyone to do it at that point. So there's a lot of learning that goes on back and forth. I could do some training like this is how I do it. This is what worked so far. And then someone else got to take the baton and run it from there and make the process even better. So yeah, it's always been the people. So versus just hiring people necessarily on match with your core values, were you also trying to look for people that maybe had more experience in an area where they could figure things out that you guys hadn't figured out yet? Yeah, well, we've been biased toward you know, hiring folks that they're kind of what I'll call high energy generalists. We haven't particularly hired folks that have specialization in any given thing. And that's because we, you know, we were and still are small. So sometimes we're hiring people because it's like, we think you're great. You're very smart. You're obviously driven. We'd like to work with you. We're not exactly sure what we're going to put you to work doing yet. So it will start you on sales. We've had people go from sales to support to success to product, right? So they've touched like all four corners mm. of the company. Others started and support went to sales. So it just depends on what the company needs that day. And then where we think we need the right balance going forward across departments. So one of the things that we've kind of hired for our folks, especially early on, but still today, folks that we feel like are founders, you know what I mean? Just by their demeanor, the way that they take ownership of problems and questions, the way they tackle things. It's like, okay, Ryan and I are the founders of this company, but they are a founder. They've been a founder before where they want to be in the future. Sometimes they know that. Like, I want to be a founder, so I want to learn from this startup so I can go do my own. Awesome. Sometimes they don't know it yet, but we know. Like, we can see it. Like, they're definitely going to start something and we don't know what it's going to be or when. Mm -hmm. But we'd like them to be on our team for as long as possible. And then sure enough, we've had, you know, a handful of people leave over the years. And, you know, we hate that. We love them to stay with us. But when they go start their own company, we, we also are happy about it. Like, that's a pretty neat outcome to see lots of former employees going off and starting successful ventures. It's pretty neat. Awesome. All right. One more question for you. If you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? Oh, I think the overriding thing, I've always been interested in doing this back from when I read, you know, books about entrepreneurs, and I would say, especially tech entrepreneurs, you know, back in high school and college. And so despite the fact that Ryan and I did start sort of early, like building websites and doing projects, I think really my advice would be to dig in earlier to something like this building something that looks like a snowball and then pushing it downhill. That's what Warren Buffett has talked about, right? You know, find, you know, find a snowball and push down the biggest mountain you can find. And so it's been fun. Like here since that obviously became more than a project. It became a full-blown business with customers and employees and so forth. And that's been very gratifying. So yeah, I guess my advice would be to get started early and often. And that, that'll be one of my goals is to do it again. Awesome. All right. Well, Brandon, where can people learn more about Cirrus Insight and connect with you? Yeah, sure. So we're on the web, of course, cirrusinsight.com. Cirrus, like the high wispy clouds, C-I-R-R-U-S. My email is brandon at cirrusinsight.com. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn. So feel free to hit me there. All right. We'll get that linked up in the show notes. Brandon, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeremy. Likewise. Appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more or hear previous episodes, you can go to blog.leadquizzes.com. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a 14-day free trial to Lead Quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. 
Please also subscribe to our show on Apple or however you get your podcasts. You can also write us at support at leadquizzes.com. I'm Jeremy Allens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.